Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to introduce our first session presented by Dr. Andrew Blakely. Dr. Blakely is a surgical oncologist at the National Cancer Institute and also the director of the Surgical Oncology Research Fellowship. In today's session, he will present SCH 101. Thank you, Dr. Blakely. All right, thank you. Afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Life Fest. Um, you know, this is actually a little intimidating because sometimes when you give a, a presentation to your peers, it's intimidating, but it's also it's intimidating when you're talking to patients who are sometimes even more expert in some ways than maybe we are. So uh, this is meant to be a broad, general overview of some of the biology behind SDH-deficient GIST. Um, and we'll probably take about half the session for that, and the other half will be Q&A. Of course, keep in mind there will be other sessions later in the weekend as far as talking about research advances, talking about surgical considerations for SDH deficient GIST, um, genetic testing and screening and counseling and things like that. So, you know, it should be comprehensive. This will not be covering all of those things, uh, but we will maybe uh, touch on some of them. So. I do want to start just to tell you a little bit about me because I see some familiar faces in the room, but a lot of you I have not met. Um, we'll talk about just broadly and then talk about what makes wild type versus non-wild type different. Um, and I know wild type is a little bit of a uh, catch-all term, but we'll focus on the SDH deficient version of wild type. Uh, we'll talk about some larger scale data sets of patients who have been diagnosed and treated with just and then uh, describe a little bit what we're doing with our research at the NIH. Uh, so feel free to stop me at any point. So where am I coming from? I did my general surgery residency in Rhode Island, and I did my uh, surgical oncology fellowship in Southern California, uh, and I've been at the NIH now for five years. Um, and you know what happened was I started, and then six months later there was a pandemic, and. Uh, I got kind of stuck because at the NIH, we don't have an ER, we don't have a referral basis. Patients come in to be treated on protocols. If you don't have a protocol, you don't have patients. And as a surgeon, if you don't operate, then you lose your skills. And so it was a difficult time, but actually it was serendipitous because that's when I met Sarah Rothschild. And she was telling me about some of the issues where um, we had a lot of patients who were adult age being diagnosed with SDH deficient GIST, and sometimes the only surgeons they were talking to were pediatric surgeons and local surgeons who maybe didn't have as much background and expertise and interest in GIST, either broadly speaking or in these subtypes. And so, you know, that inspired a natural history study that I started writing in March 2020. Um, and opened at the end of that year. Um, and again, the LifeRaft group was really instrumental in that process. So just to talk about epidemiology, broadly speaking, um, you know, gastrointestinal stromal tumors are the most common soft tissue sarcoma. Uh, there's about 10 to 15 cases per million annually. So in the United States, about five to 6,000 diagnoses. It's interesting because that is above the threshold of what we consider a rare disease. A rare disease is 3,000 or fewer diagnosed in the United States every year. But of course, when we start looking at subtypes, then we find that, yes, subsets of GIS are rare. Um, and of course, you know, that's where some of these differences as far as treatment approach and considerations are really important. Um, regardless of what's driving them, we do uh, believe that they arise from the interstitial cells of Cajal, which are like the pacemaker cells for the GI tract. And that's why they can arise anywhere from esophagus to anus. Um, most commonly, they're going to be found in the stomach, second most commonly in the small intestine, but then there are more occasional cases in the colon, the esophagus, and the rectum. Um, and then a couple case reports out there as far as the appendix, but again, more of a colonic type origin. The median age of diagnosis overall is 65 years. Of course, we know that with SDH deficiency, that is much younger than that. Um, and when we think about what drives most GISTs, so about 75% of them, or depending on which article or data set you're looking at, somewhere between 65 and 75 percent of them are driven by mutations in KIT. Um, and about 10 to 15 percent are driven by mutations in PDGFRA. What are they? These are transmembrane proteins. So this is a picture of the membrane of the cell. 
And parts of this receptor are on the inside, so this is the cytosol, and on the outside is the extracellular membrane. And this is where there's different point mutations in these different exons. And for example, for folks who have mutations in um, KIT in exon 9, one of the reasons why it's relatively resistant to imatinib is because that exon sits on the extracellular portion of the receptor, whereas the other parts of it are on the intracellular side of the membrane. Um, so that's part of where that relative resistance comes from. But this is the general uh, epidemiology of which ones of these are most common. Of course, with KIT, exon 11 is the most common, and then we see secondary mutations in exons 13, 17, uh, sometimes 14 and 18. And then PDGFRA, the most notorious one is the D842V. But these are mutations in one or the other. They tend to be mutually exclusive. They're unusually germline, although I do have a couple of patients who are siblings who have germline KIT mutations. And so the whole GI tract is at risk. Um, and they these are considered non-wild type. And it's a little bit different because a lot of times when we talk about predisposition syndromes, wild type is normal. But in this sense, the normal version of GIST, normal, is when there's mutations in these genes. And when there's no mutations in these two genes, that's when we call them wild type. And when we talk about wild type, that's where most of them are associated with SDH deficiency. So 15% of GIST have no mutations in either KIT or PDGFRA. And of those, about two-thirds have an issue with the SDH complex. There's other drivers of wild type GIST. So NF1 or neurofibromatosis 1 is another driver. And then we have some more, much more unusual ones with NTRAC3, FGFR1, and BRAF. But really, when we think about it, the vast majority are SDH deficient, and most of the remainder are going to be NF1 associated. Um, these mutations are more often germline, and that's why considerations as far as genetic testing and counseling and ramifications for children, parents, siblings, and family planning have a much bigger role in SDH deficiency because these are inherited in autosomal dominant fashion, so 50% chance that a child will inherit one of these genes. And that's, where we, that's what we mean when we talk about germline. And so these are, again, these are the wild type. I want to take a, a pause there and ask anybody have any questions. Um not X and Y, but the other chromosomes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so where those genes are located in the twenty three or forty six, you know, twenty three paired chromosomes one of those copies will be passed on to a child. So there's a 50% chance that it's the one copy of the gene that has the mutation in it. So the germline is to say that all cells in that patient have that mutation in the SDH gene or the NF1 gene. So that's, when we talk about germline genetic testing, it's a different type of testing. So there's, so this is a good point. There's two types of genetic testing. One is somatic. When we talk about somatic, we're talking about tumor tissue. And that's where we test what is the mutation or what are the mutations within the tumor tissue. And that's where we find exon 11 mutations, exon 9 mutations in kit, PGFRA mutations, because again, they're not germline, they're specific to the tumor tissue. On the flip side, when we have germline mutations, they're inherited. And so somebody in the family is what we call the proband. The proband is the first person who developed a mutation in that gene. And it has to be in their, you know, either sperm or, or, over, or, or ovaries, um, in the sense that it has to be a the mutation has to be there to then be passed on to the child. But then all of the cells come from that, and so all of the cells will have that mutation in the SDH gene when it's an SDH deficient just with a genetic mutation. And we'll get into a little bit more of the nuance with that too. So that's the germline genetic testing is when they either take a cheek swab or a blood test. Because then what they're looking at is blood cells, not tumor cells, to find that mutation. And it's usually a panel of about 80 genes. 
So SDH A, B, C, and D are part of those panels for that reason. Yes? Are the germline mutations somatic? The germline, so at some point they were in the sense that somebody had to have it first. Um, so sometimes we diagnose the proband, meaning the first person in the family to have developed that. So if one person has it and we test both their parents, one of them is gonna, it's a 50% chance that one of them has that mutation. But it's possible that the first person to be diagnosed with SDH deficiency is the first person in the family to have developed it. Sometimes we don't know because, of course, our understanding of GIST is so much better in the last 25 years since it was identified as a different entity than leiomyoma or leiomyosarcoma. Um, but of course, sometimes people don't have detailed family histories or to know what, ha what somebody may have died of 30, 40 years ago to have said, oh, this is actually GIST or pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma that was predisposed by SDH deficiency. It's a good question. So it depends on the mutation. Um, and I think Samantha Greenberg will go into a little bit more of this. But we do see there's not a, there's not a, a perfect what we call a genotype phenotype correlation. So somebody may have the mutation and never develop anything. Some, of the, some people will have a mutation and the same mutation as other family members and they'll develop only gists. And some people will have the same mutation to develop only pheochromocytomas or paragangliomas. And some people with the same mutation will develop both. So it's highly variable. So the penetrance, when we say penetrance, the, the likelihood, oh good, now that Samantha Greenberg is here, she can correct everything I'm saying. It's perfect. Oh, nice. so, <laughs> so it's to say that just because you have the mutation doesn't mean that there's a 100% chance that you will develop any of these. So I, I think the one where there's a difference in whether you inherit it from your father or your mother is SDHD. And Dr. Greenberg likes to use it as SDH dad for that reason. <laughs> so you blame him. In the sense that uh, a woman with an SDHD mutation apparently is unlikely to pass that along to her children, whereas if it comes from the father, then they are predisposed. So each time it's a coin toss. So you could have three in a row who don't inherit it, but then the next three might. And so it's, it's just a 50% chance each time. And each one is independent of each other. Now if you look at it from a population standpoint, it's gonna be about 50%, but within a family, because there's only so many children, then it may not be a perfect half and half. Yes? There's a lot we don't know, because why gist of all things? I, I don't know that we have a great answer to that question. Um, there are a lot of genetic predisposition syndromes, and we call them predispositions because it increases the chance of developing that, but doesn't mean that that person is guaranteed to develop it, whether it's um, BRCA1 or BRCA2 or CDH1 or other germline genetic inherited um, predispositions. But it is to say that just with this, it's very variable and I don't know if we have, we're not able to tell who's going to get what or why they develop it when they do. And it's also to say not just whether it's GIST or paraganglioma or both or neither, the age of onset is also not 
a perfect correlation. So you know, we have patients who are diagnosed and, and don't manifest anything until then they're in their 50s or 60s. And so it's not just a pediatric and young adult disease. It's, you know, it's a spectrum over time. Um, it doesn't as far as inheritance, as far as prevalence of the mutations, there probably are differences, but I would actually defer. <laughs> I know, I'm like, oh, let me add this to my slide deck for tomorrow. Yeah, they were like, do you have your slides? I was like, oh, no, wait till after this talk. Um, so I would say that the currently, not that we know of, but the only diff, sorry, hi everyone, I'm Samantha, I'm the uh, genetic counselor at UT Southwestern, and I'll be speaking all about germline testing and what it means for families tomorrow, um, as well as uh, we'll be on the SDA panel as well. So um, I think the key difference, in, and I'll talk about this in the slides, is that we sometimes get what we call variants of uncertain significance, um, where we're not quite sure whether a genetic change is uh, tumor and risk increasing or whether it's just something that makes us us. Um, and we know fairly well that in um, primarily white populations that we have a lower rate of those uncertain findings because we haven't actually done, um, in, in the past, we haven't done historical genetic research that's been equitable and access across those ancestries. So I don't think that we know that because right now we know that there's higher rates of those uncertain findings um, in our non-white populations and that a majority of those could be cancer, you know, increasing risk, et cetera, but we don't necessarily have that because we still have a lot more work to do when we think about equitable research. and that's. About a decade, we've been starting to realize, like, hey, we gotta test. We gotta research everyone. We gotta really be inclusive in our approaches. And so, um, while I would love to say we have found things in a decade, I think we still have a lot of work to do in terms of those variants. Yes. Have you found any um, things that make me think? Of, have you found any? Sorry, I have brain fog from medicine. <laughs> um, <laughs> A, it's a really good question, and I, I think it's hard to say. You know, one of the things is when we're talking about a fundamentally rare disease, because we're talking about, you know, 15% or maybe 10% of 5,000 patients per year in the United States. So 500 people every year are diagnosed with SDH deficient gist. Um, it's very hard to comprehensively look at environmental exposures or other factors that would be identified across several patients or many patients to say this appears to be a trigger uh, or associated with development of either GIST or paraganglioma um, because you would have to have not just the patients who have developed GIST or paraganglioma but also the family members who have not but that sort of a larger scale study I think would be challenging to carry out. Um, there's probably some commonalities with things that we know predisposed to cancer in general, like smoking and you know diet and exercise or lack thereof and things like that. As far as other more specific triggers, I don't think we have the same thing like asbestos and mesothelioma, for example. Um, and so there are probably things that relatively increase that risk, but I wouldn't say there's something that we know specifically is associated. Any other questions before we move on a little bit? Okay. Um, so we think about how to diagnose GIST. Of course, I don't have to tell anybody here um, because I think you all know better than I do, but also you can probably speak to just how variable it is, how people get diagnosed or how you have been diagnosed compared to other folks. Um, we can use imaging, and sometimes we find this incidentally on imaging that's being done for another reason. Sometimes the endoscopy is being done because of relative symptoms, and we find a mass that's underneath the mucosa or the inner lining of the stomach, as shown here. Uh, endoscopic ultrasound can also be used to uh, confirm that that's under the inner lining of the um, mucosa. And then sometimes it's we see a mass, we take it out, and we figure it out after the fact. Uh, I hope nobody's squeamish. There's only a couple of pictures like that throughout the presentation. 
Um, so when you think about surgical pathology, as a surgeon, what I you know, care about is taking care of patients, but then also doing as, as high quality of surgery as I possibly can, and then reviewing that path report and saying that you know, we got certain factors. So there are certain things that we cannot control about the tumor. We can't control its primary size. We can't control where it is, whether it's in the stomach or the small bowel or wherever else. And we can't control the mitotic rate. Um, and mitotic rate is just uh, a sign that cells are undergoing mitosis or division. And so it's a matter of the proliferation rate of the tumor and relatively how quickly is it growing. What we can control is margin status, usually. And the margin status we really want is not just a clean margin to the naked eye, but we really want the pathologist to come back and say, microscopically, it's also clean. Because of course, if we leave a microscopically positive margin where there's tumor cells where we cut on the stomach or the bowel, then the risk is that's gonna come back. And as you all know, we can make up for that with non-wild type just by giving people imatinib, but we don't have an imatinib for you to say this is how we can risk reduce you and prevent this or prolong the time to, for this to come back. So I think negative margins is ideal. We can also usually control intraoperative rupture because it's one thing when we're removing multiple tumors from the liver, multiple tumors from the peritoneum, it's another thing when one of those breaks apart because then we have microscopic seeding in areas that maybe weren't previously involved. And I tend to be very restrictive in when I will do a minimally invasive surgery because I don't think I can control this as well through either the robotic platform or laparoscopically as with my hands. Um, and then the completeness of site erection is fundamentally important. And you know, the, the idea being that if I'm gonna offer somebody a debulking to remove all of the peritoneal tumors, I don't do any good if I remove 80%, maybe a little bit. But really I wanna get to 95% or 100% if at all possible. Um, and the same goes for the liver. Like if we're gonna do an operation on the liver, we wanna cut out larger tumors and anything that's deeper and smaller, we'll ablate them to burn them and deal with it um, to get as complete a site reduction as possible. There's things that we wanna balance with that too. Like we don't wanna go super aggressive and say, okay, we removed everything we could see, but then leave the patient at risk for more complications, more issues. And the worst thing that I could possibly do is do a really aggressive liver surgery and then you, the patient is left with changes in their liver function tests and makes them then ineligible for subsequent clinical trials. Because that's, again, I'm not, I, I have no illusion that I am going to cure somebody when they have multiple metastases in their liver. I will control as best as I can. But the idea is to, as we say, reset the clock and help get that person to a clinical trial that might be able to achieve that systemic control that no surgery can achieve. So there's different priorities, and balancing those is really important. And you know, being able to do that for an individual patient, because I would probably, you know, if 10 of you came and said, I want surgery, it's gonna be 10 different surgeries. And there's gonna be 10 different thresholds for what we're gonna do and why we're gonna do it for each of you, because each of you are different. And where you are, what's going on, and where we wanna get you is gonna be tailored to you as a person. When we talk about pathology classification, I really want to highlight this because this is really important. And it's something that even, you know, we talk to our research fellows about, you know, understanding what does this stuff mean. When we look at whether the gist is SDH deficient or not SDH deficient, it does not matter. They will almost always stain for either CD117 or CKIT or DOG1. And one of the most common misconceptions, even among medical providers, is they'll say, CD1 CD117 positive, patient has a kit mutant tumor, which is not true. It just says this is a gist, and that's all. It doesn't tell you anything about mutation status. And I think it's so critically important, but it's, I don't know why it's just kind of missed by a lot of folks. Um, one of the biggest things is the SDH, SDHB immunohistochemistry. It's cheap, it's widely available, and rapidly differentiates between an SDH deficient gist and a non-SDH deficient gist. And I know Denise and other folks at the LifeRap group 
have really, really tried to increase awareness and make this one of the mandatory reporting criteria for synoptic reporting from the American College of Pathology because there's no reason to not do it. And it just cannot be overstated. And it's one of the first things that we would ask for if somebody said, we don't, we're not sure what the driver is. We're not sure you know, what kind of gist this is. If we can get archival tissue, we can do that stain. Any unstained slides or unstained block or uncut block, we can do that and tell you very quickly. So, you know, I really wanted to highlight this because, again, it's, it's um, something that needs to be emphasized for everyone. Uh, and a lot of times, it's most important for patients to advocate because, as you all know, a lot of times you're going to be more up on this stuff than maybe some of the folks that you've met in the clinic and in your healthcare facilities back home. The other things, um, you know, SDH deficient just tends to be exclusive to the stomach. So while we talk about just being about 60% from the stomach, you know, probably about 100% are from the stomach when it's SDH deficient specifically. Um, it's also more likely to be multifocal. Because in a kit mutant gist, it's a population of cells that have picked up that kit mutation. It's just the tumor that has a mutation, and it's just the one. But here, we consider it like a field defect. The entire GI tract doesn't have the, a competent SDH complex, but for some reason, it's just the stomach that's predisposed to developing the gists, but it's the whole stomach. Now, we do see that there is, I'll get to that a little bit later, there is some regionality within the stomach where we find that the gists tend to arise in either the body of the stomach or distal in the stomach, not usually up by the esophagus. Um, when it's specific types of the SDH deficient gist, the SDHC epigenetic silencing, I think it can be more proximal, but most of these are gonna be in the body of the stomach, which is good because then we're not usually talking about a total gastrectomy. So the issue is when the gists are arising very close to where the esophagus connects into the stomach, it can be very hard to do anything short of a total gastrectomy in order to remove all of that disease, especially when, again, we don't have an imatinib or another reliable therapy to downstage it and try to get that tumor to shrink away from the esophagus and offer a surgery that's not just a total gastrectomy. Any questions about that? Um, I think CD117 has been around probably since basically when it was identified. Dog 1 came along later um, because dog 1 literally means, um, what is it? Discovered on GIST. Discovered on GIST. I couldn't think what the D was. Thank you. So yeah, discovered on GIST. Um, now it's not specific to GIST. There are sometimes other things that will express dog 1, but by and large, 95% of the time if it's staying for dog 1, it's going to be a GIST. Um, and the gist will stay in for one or the other or both close to 100% of the time. Not, not perfect, but pretty close. Um, so dog one, I think, came along several years later. And SDHB, I'm not sure when the IHC became available. I think it's only been the last few years, but I'm not sure. It's, it's so it's, that's why it's not as widespread and it hasn't become all right. That's why we're still in the process of trying to make it part of that synoptic reporting. The best would be if there is a tissue block because then um, when there's a tissue block, what they'll do is they'll cut slides off the block and that's probably going to be a little bit more reliable. Now there is some degradation over time. So will it be, so if it's, there may be some variability as far as the, the, the reliability of that result. Is it worth doing? I don't see why not. Because if you see SDHB expression, 
then you know it's, it's SDH competent, not SDH deficient. If it's absent, there'll still be a little bit of a question as far as is it absent because the tissue has degraded to the point where it's not going to stain positive, or is it absent because it's absent and it's SDH deficient? So there might still be a little bit of a question. We'll, we'll get to that, okay. but it's it's basically any loss of any of the four subunits of the complex A, B, C, or D will lead to loss of staining of SDHB. Okay. So it doesn't tell you which one, but it does tell you that it's at least SDH deficient. We, that's a good question. Um, we don't know exactly how to interpret mitotic counts. Because, you know, you probably all have come across the uh, nomograms or the, the ri um, risk of recurrence. That's all based on kit mutant gist and PGFRA mutant gist. And so how the mitotic rate correlates with biology to say, we, I don't think that we can really say that a high mitotic rate is going to say that this is going to metastasize. Um, so it's not as well defined a correlation, but that's an area of active research to try and understand that. But of course, we have to have enough patients who have uh, the mitotic rate assessed. Because that's one of the other issues, is that a lot of patients will dig up their path reports from several years ago, and the mitotic rate may not have been actually included. And that's one of the issues is that we have a lot of missing data. So in addition to trying to get the SDHB reported, it's also, again, the synoptic reporting is to say the pathologist has to report certain aspects. Uh, they do a great job when it's, you know, breast cancer, colon cancer, things like that. Um, but trying to enhance the quality of those reports for something like GIST is, you know, a really important endeavor as well. And that way we could then go back and say, okay, now we have 500 patients with SDH deficient GIST and we have mitotic rates from the primary tumors, and we have long-term follow-up to know outcomes to try and correlate the two. Um, one of the other things that the pathologists would generally not do is if you cut out one just from the stomach, one from the lymph node, and then three from the liver, they're not gonna give you mitotic rates of all five of those spots. That's more of a sort of research initiative, and you have to have a pathologist who's willing to go back and do that. Um, so I can get Dr. Mutton to do it, but a lot of times folks aren't going to be able to get their pathologist to do that. Yes? Is there a difference, <clears throat> is there a difference in the surgical approach to germline and epimutin versus non-germline SDHs? That's a good question. So, so kind of going along with that field def defect, say that the stomach is at risk for developing GIST, because we think about m not just multifocality, but also new primaries. We don't really worry about new primaries with KIT or PDGFRA mutants in GIST because we think that those, that population of cells that was going to turn into GIST in the stomach has been removed already. The rest of the stomach should be theoretically normal and not have those mutations. In SDH deficiency, it's not really the case, especially in germline settings. It's not to say that we have evidence to tell a patient taking out your entire stomach is definitely beneficial. It's only beneficial if that's the only way to remove all of the gists. Um, but again, to say that since it seems to be mostly the body and the distal stomach, what we've done is more like subtotal gastrectomies to at least leave some of the proximal stomach that's unaffected and preserve as much stomach as possible. Because for example, one of the competing priorities <coughs> for a young woman who has SDHC epigenetic silencing with multifocal gist is we wanna remove all the gist in the stomach because they're either painful or bleeding or at risk for rupture and further growth. By the same token, taking a 20 something year old woman and removing her entire stomach sets her up for a whole host of other problems like osteoporosis, nutritional deficiencies. Um, you know, a total gastrectomy is, is pretty big operation. Uh, it's easier to tolerate in your 20s, but the issue is also 
if your life expectancy is another 40, 50 years, there's a lot of downstream consequences of taking out that stomach. So what we do instead is try and preserve as much stomach as possible, not go to the extent of a total gastrectomy, so that that person, generally it's gonna be a woman, is able to avoid some of those downstream consequences. Other questions? Um, so we look at, this is just a different way of showing it in a more of a schematic to, again, just talk about the majority, let me see, this is, I think, there we go. So again, the majority are going to be associated with mutations in the PDG PDGFRA, the other 15% is wild type, most of those are going to be SDH deficient, so this is 5 to 8% overall. Um, and the way to differentiate these two is the SDHB staining. Um, and this is where we talk about A, B, C, and D, and we'll get to the, the pathways a little bit more. So why is SDH unique? Uh, when we were in biology and then medical school and everything, we learned all about the Krebs cycle because we had to memorize it for the test. We promptly forgot it. Um, we learned about the electron transport chain and promptly forgot about it. And SDH, succinate dehydrogenase, happens to be the one enzyme that's involved in both of these cellular processes. So there's probably that's one of the reasons why SDH deficiency, as opposed to another type of enzyme deficiency, leads to pheochromocytomas, paragangliomas, and gists, and renal cell carcinoma. Um, we don't always mention that with everything else, but it is another important entity that we do see uh, with our urology, urology colleagues. Um, but why it does, again, we still don't know. But this is, goes back to your question before. So the inactivation of any of the SDH subunits leads to the lack of a functional SDH complex. If you're missing one of the subunits, the complex is no longer stabilized. And the component that deteriorates or degrades quickest is the SDHB. And so that's why when we stain, we stain for SDHB, and it's just say that whether it's SDH A, B, C, or D, one of them is non-functional, and we lose that complex. So in response to that, succinate accumulates because it's no longer getting processed, processed into fumarate. And then HIF1-alpha is stabilized. And I'm highlighting this only because, or in particular because, when we talk about HIF1-alpha, of course, this is the target of one of the ongoing clinical trials right now with belzutifan, is to try and undo this process of HIF1-alpha HIF1 stabilization. When HIF1-alpha is stabilized, then angiogenesis pathways are stimulated, and angiogenesis is what tumors require in order to keep growing, because they need a blood supply. And this is one of the things we see with GISTs, is that when they get really large, the periphery of the tumor is alive because it has good blood supply, it parasitizes from all over the place, and usually or often the center of it is rather necrotic, because it's kind of outstripped its blood supply. And this is also why we see tumors bleed into themselves or we see that they become rather cystic and fluid-filled over time. So sometimes, you know, we'll say, oh, we found a 14-centimeter tumor, and it sounds really impressive, but then you realize that the vast majority of that is either simple fluid or old blood, not really viable tumor. The issue, of course, is that those types of tumors are easier to rupture because their wall is so thin and so fragile. What we rely on when we do surgery in GIST is that it has a pseudocapsule, so it's it's something that's kind of encapsulated and it tends to push surrounding structures as opposed to invade. So we can separate gists from normal stomach, normal liver, normal peritoneal structures, which is really important when we talk about intestine and colon and things like that. Um, but we call it a pseudo capsule because it doesn't have the same structural integrity as a real capsule, like capsule around the spleen or the liver, for example. Um, but again, that's, that's where some of this uh, risk of rupture comes in. And then this whole process may also promote hypermethylation. And maybe that helps tie in why SDHC epigenetic silencing. The epigenetic silencing is because of hypermethylation and essentially loss of expression of SDHC, even absent a mutation in the SDHC gene. And maybe this helps link all of that together. Uh, and also, potentially increase the value of demethylating agents, although there was a trial, oh, I think eight, 10 years ago, 
uh, NIH was part of that and did not seem to be beneficial. Um, we look at just, so we talk about subunits A, B, C, and D. There's also SCHA factor two. Uh, we don't really talk about that though because it doesn't really have clinical implications when we focus specifically on GIST, but that is a uh, fifth sort of uh, component of the SCH complex. And then the SCHC promoter hyper hypermethylation uh, is where we differentiate the SCHC mutation here from the silencing where, again, no mutation but functionally no SDHC is being produced. So this is courtesy of Smith Greenberg back there. Thank you again. Um, so why, how does this epigenetic silencing occur? So promoters are what turn genes on. So you see the promoter region is upstream of what gets transcribed into RNA and then translated into proteins. Methylation is a normal process that can turn the promoter off. When it's abnormally turned off, though, then the promoter prevents any expression of this SDHC gene. And without that subunit, again, that complex falls apart. And this is fundamentally not germline. This is not heritable. It is unique to the person. So they didn't get it from anybody, and they cannot give it to anybody else. So. <laughs> Um, going back to what are some of the other differences, uh, I highlighted this part, which was the prognosis being predicted by size and mitotic rate algorithm, as you've seen as far as risk of recurrence, holds up for the usual or non-wild type gist, but not for our SDH efficient gist. Um, and then one other thing that we have to keep in mind is that it is more, you know, much more common to go to lymph nodes um, when it's SDH deficient. And I think people, different people will tell you different rates. Uh, I think. A lot of series will say about 10 to 15 percent, whereas, or maybe up to 20 percent. I think Dr. Sickhook will say about 40 percent in his experience. I think some of it is just going to be uh, kind of what we see. Um, but in kit and PDGFRA mutation uh, driven gists, very rare for it to go to lymph nodes. The other thing that's different about gists in general is it is a type of sarcoma, but it's like the one sarcoma that doesn't typically go to lung. When we think about a lot of other sarcoma subtypes, metastases go to lung. When we think about GIST, it's primarily liver, peritoneum, and then lymph nodes are the top three sites. After that, we do see sometimes um, distant lymph nodes like the axilla, or the armpits, and then a, and bone as well. So what I was getting at before is that with SDH deficient GIST, it tends to occur in the body and the distal stomach. And I think there's an uh, open question Dr. Sickleck and I have been asking, but trying to actually design and carry out this trial would be challenging, to say the least, of even if we were to say we're not going to do a total gastrectomy to risk reduce somebody, but maybe a distal gastrectomy or a subtotal gastrectomy would be relatively beneficial in order to prevent a new primary from arising. The issue, of course, is that that would require a lot of patients who have one tumor in the distal stomach where they were willing to be randomized to either a partial gastrectomy or a distal gastrectomy. And then we probably have to follow that patient for a good 20 years. And that's challenging. Uh, it's because folks move and, you know, for not for the NIH, but for other places, they change insurances and they can't follow up with their providers and this and that. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of logistical issues as far as how do you power and carry out a study like that. But it is a, I want to let you know about it as far as a thought that we have had as surgeons. Um, and then the epimutants tend to have more multifocal and more proximal involvement. We talk about screening for SDH deficiency. So for folks who have confirmed, have been confirmed to have that mutation, um, recommendations are whole body non-contrast MRI every two to three years, and that's a general screening particularly for uh, paragangioma and pheochromocytoma. Dedicated MRI of the neck with contrast, that's for carotid body tumors, which can also be associated with SDH deficiency. And then serum catecholamines, metanephrines, and chromogranin A on an annual basis. We always do that before surgery just to make sure that nothing is manifested in the meantime because this is what can cause more problems with general anesthesia than anything else if there's an active pheochromocytoma or paragangioma that has not been identified and the patient has not undergone the proper blockade of those vasoactive hormones. Um, and then also surveillance imaging tailored to the areas of known disease. So 
for folks who have undergone liver surgery, MRI is the best um, imaging. Uh, sometimes things like PET scans and CAT scans can add information. I think CAT scan is just is, is good for peritoneal disease. Um, some, some institutions like MRI of the abdomen and pelvis or the peritoneum. I think a nice, you know, high quality CAT scan is, is perfect. Um, but MRI is ideal for liver and it's also ideal for the renal cell carcinomas. So sometimes it's not common because some of the other things, some patients have pheochromosomas and paragonioma, some people have just, some people have both. Uh, we have a lot of patients who have SDH deficient renal cell carcinoma, usually associated with SDHB. Um, they don't seem to tend to develop cysts. Um, and we would know because they get MRI abdomen on a routine basis, which covers the liver and the stomach. And so it's just another kind of curious thing about SDH deficiency. Um, so again, there's a wide spectrum. So we see the you know, single primary here in the stomach. We see here, this is a patient with uh, SDH deficiency who had a prior partial gastrectomy. That really bright dot right there is the staple line on the stomach. And this is the peritoneal metastasis right next to it. And then this is a lymph node in the same patient next to the stomach that was involved. We also see uh, widespread um, involvement of the liver. And this is an example of one of these liver metastases that has bled into itself and degenerated into a large cyst. Um, and then with your permission, we have others where we have many tumors and there's not an immediately apparent surgical opportunity for that patient, but with good systemic treatment, sometimes we can get them there. And then also the peritoneum. And so these are images from laparoscopy. And laparoscopy, the value cannot be overstated for peritoneal involvement because these are things that you may not see on a CAT scan, a PET scan, or an MRI. But clearly you can see this gist on the left pelvic side wall. This is the rectum coming down into the pelvis. You see a little bit of fluid down there. So this is one on the left pelvic side wall. These are several gists here on the peritoneum right on top of the bladder. And then this is the omentum. And it's stuck up against the abdominal wall, but you see several of these just kind of stuck on there. Uh, hard to keep track of these, and sometimes we get surprised when we get in there because we expect to find five or six tumors, and then we find, I was surprised uh, at the beginning of June with, I don't think I'm exaggerating, 400. Um, and so, you know, this is, I like the laparoscopy for planning, either before that type of an operation or at the time, also because it gives me a good visualization of the diaphragm surfaces, the pelvis, to know how big the incision needs to be, how extensive the surgery is going to be, um, and what we think the likely outcome and the goals of that surgery are going to be. Uh, I do also uh, a lot with peritoneal surface malignancies, so when appendiceal cancer, ovarian cancer, colon cancer spread to the peritoneum, and I use laparoscopy a lot, and I think that for just for certain patients it makes a lot of sense too. Yes? Good question. So when we think about what the size that it needs to be in order to trigger being found on imaging, on the peritoneal surfaces, are usually about eight millimeters. And so you know the the one on the pelvic side wall here is probably over that threshold. But the issue is also it has this is the mesorectum and epiploicus, which basically outpouchings of fat off of the colon. Everybody has them. Um, and it can be hard to distinguish because the, the appearance of this in the CAT scan, they're going to have the same sort of density. And so it can be hard to distinguish this from that, especially when you don't have the benefit of the abdomen being blown up with air to separate those structures. Uh, and then these would be very unusual to see them with a collapsed bladder or a distended bladder as well. Uh, the MRI, so the reason why I like CAT scan too is it's a little more reliable. Um, to get an MRI abdomen and pelvis, then the patient usually needs to be in the scanner for a good hour, hour and a quarter. It's a lot. And there's a lot more motion just because they have, to, you know, you have to go through different breath holes in order to try and keep the image as still as possible. And even with the best of circumstances, 
I think the resolution of a CAT scan looking at the peritoneum is just as good. Now we look at the at the liver, it's there's less movement of the liver. Well, not really less movement, but being a solid organ, the differentiation of normal liver versus not normal liver is clearer. One of the issues that we run into with the MRI sometimes is actually it's too sensitive, and so that's one thing that we're looking at because the resolution for the MRI is down to about three millimeters. So then you start seeing things and worrying, well, maybe there's new spots popping up. And maybe there are. There's also a lot of artifacts in the liver because the timing of the MRI, it may look like there's something there, but different phases may not show it as reliably. So it's trying to strike the right balance. But again, I think that the laparoscopy is fundamentally very, very helpful. Anybody who's had sure. So any previous surgeries where they noted peritoneal involvement, and so sometimes that's noted at the time of the initial surgery. I think that it can make sense for somebody like this, where we know that this is probably not in the stomach, but it's actually next to the stomach. Sometimes on the CAT scan, we will see these types of things in the omentum because then these are kind of floating on the fat of the omentum, and they're going to have a higher density than the omentum itself, because then it's comparing a tumor to fat. Whereas here, because of the structures on the other side of the pelvic sidewall, it's not quite as distinct. So sometimes the, the, those sorts of findings will prompt that. Now, for example, the patient who we ended up finding 400 tumors, um, his imaging didn't really reflect that very well. So we were a little surprised. Um, everything worked out okay. But, uh, you know, that was, even, even with both an MRI and a CAT scan, it severely underappreciated the amount of disease. Any other questions? Okay. You can go first. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Rupture. Yep. That's a good question. Um, so I will answer that question a couple of ways. Liver biopsies can often be a little safer in the sense that when they're going through the skin, they're usually going through the skin kind of on that right abdominal wall, and they're going right into, usually, into the liver, because the less common will they go on the left. If they go on the left, that's a little bit more mobile. What I'm getting at is where that biopsy happens, the liver will tend to seal against the abdominal wall. Um, but what I would generally recommend is if there's a choice, I would not biopsy anything that's cystic for that reason. Uh, and I, would, I think it would be safer to biopsy, whether it's in the liver, it's the omentum, a more solid tumor, because it'll generally be able to tolerate a puncture without free rupture. With, for example, I had a patient who, did, who had NF1, um, and at his local facility, they wanted to get a biopsy because he was actually being worked up for something totally different, and they found this huge cystic mass. And we looked at it, and we said, he should just go right to surgery because the biopsy is going to be very risky. It's going to have all of those issues. They weren't comfortable doing it, which was a good thing, um, but we just figured it was just and went straight to the operating room and took that out. And it was just, but for that reason, you know, since it was a very large cystic mass, no one wanted to stick a needle in it, and I recommend they do not stick a needle in it for exactly that reason. But that's why I think the solid masses will tend to tolerate a needle biopsy better without that risk of free rupture and seeding. For, for the next patient. Oh, one second. You had a question too.
It's a good question. So that was probably found by a dotatate scan. Yeah. yeah. So the dotatate scan is great for pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. Uh, generally, just should not light up on a dotatate scan. Uh, I think with SDH deficiency, there sometimes have been patients who have had some activity in gists on dotatate. Um, but it should not light up as well or as uniformly as a paraganglioma would. So there, there probably is some cross-expression of that receptor, but just generally should not do that. You had a question? Yeah, so I think if we go back to, oh, actually, I have to go forward now. Let me see, let me see. When we go to this one, so you can see in the liver, you know, on this MRI, it's clearly fluid filled. And, and MRIs are very good at distinguishing solid from, right. from liquid. But even if I had a good picture, oh, let me see, of the CAT scan. You know, these are clearly solid. So you can tell this, this has the same density as both the liver and the spleen. So this is a very solid lymph node. That is a very solid peritoneal metastasis. You will often see a central area with less enhancement because the enhancement is from the contrast. And if it's cystic, there's no blood vessels in that cystic portion, and so it won't light up as much. So you should be able to tell with a reasonable contrast enhanced MRI or CAT scan. So I think the best indications for a laparoscopic or robotic removal of a gist is something that's less than five centimeters and ideally hanging off the greater curve of the stomach. So that way it's kind of up like this. If there's anything on like the lesser curve of the stomach, which is more around where this lymph node is, there's a lot of blood vessels around there. And one of the things that I worry about is when it's minimally invasive, not only tumor rupture, but also inadvertent narrowing of the stomach. Because even if we've removed the gist and we have negative margins, if the patient comes out and then we find out the patient has relative gastric outlet obstruction because the stomach is narrowed and they can't eat normally and things aren't moving through the right way, then again, we've kind of robbed Peter to pay Paul in a way. So that's not really an ideal outcome either. I think that what we've also done at the NIH, um, we've incorporated endoscopy into all of our surgeries now. And just the other day, uh, we had a patient who had a primary mass. We don't know if it's a gist or not. Looks like a gist, walks like a gist, quacks like a gist, probably a gist. And so uh, we took it out of the lesser curve and we sort of made, the, instead of having a pouch for a stomach, now she has kind of a channel. Um, and we did a completion endoscopy. And that way our GI colleagues went back in, insufflated the stomach and looked, everything looked good. So there's different things that we can do. I don't like personally, I'm not saying it's the wrong thing to do. I'm not, I'm not criticizing other people to do this. I don't like relying on things like bougies. So bougies is when you put, you know, a plastic, basically rod, through the esophagus into the stomach, and then you staple next to the bougie. And the bougie, you know, is meant to ensure that there's enough of an opening from the esophagus going to the stomach that you haven't narrowed it to lead to, you know, an inability to eat or a stricture. But that's it's a little indirect for me. But robotic surgery, laparoscopic surgery, anything higher up on the stomach is going to rely on that. Again, it's, it would be considered standard of care. There's nothing wrong with it. But it's just my practice is you know, a little different. I think that I, I always feel better when I've been able to appreciate and manage and optimize everything I possibly can. A lot of times it's through a small incision in the upper abdomen as opposed to Sometimes we don't save anybody anything by doing a minimally invasive surgery because we still need an extraction site and additional port sites. Because a robotic surgery, generally you have five ports. You have four for the robot, one for the assistant, and then one of those is again opened up wider to actually remove whatever the specimen is. If you take all of those incisions and you add them up, my incision is probably going to be the same thing. So, again, it's not about right or wrong. Mm 
lymph nodes. Lymph nodes. Yep. And I think you said never to the lungs? Not never, but very unusual. So usually if we have SDH deficient gist and something in the lung, mm -hmm. it's going to be an SDHC epigenetic silencing with a pulmonary chondroma, by and large. Because that's, that's the third component. Pulmonary what? Pulmonary chondroma. And so again, this is associated with uh, SDHC epigenetic silencing. We don't often see, I'm not saying never, but I, I try never to say never or always in medicine because somebody is going to prove us wrong. But uh, generally, do not see lung meds. I think I've seen more patients with bone metastases as opposed to lung metastases. For any of the SDHC? For any, any gists, really. Yes, Dr. Boykos. Yeah. <laughs> Sosi Patros. I figured you know who it was. Yeah. But I had asked the question, because I have SDHA, and mm -hmm. I have unidentified subcentimeter spots in my lungs, which the original liver surgeon who saw me thought were metastasis. But then the Greek doctor says, no, SDHA doesn't go to the lung. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, but the chondroma wouldn't be associated with SDHA very commonly at all. Yeah, so the other thing is that one of the issues with the lungs is it can still be very hard to characterize what things are until they've reached a certain size. And the same thing in the liver. So we might detect something that's three or four millimeters because a CAT scan of the lungs is going to be very sensitive, just like an MRI in the liver. And we may see something that's three or four millimeters in size, but we can't really say what it is. So when something gets to a centimeter in size, it's easier to then characterize and say, is this something that's likely malignant, or is this something that's you know, a marker of either fibrosis or infection or something else? And so if it's you know, multiple sub-centimeter nodules in the lungs that have been stable over time, some people will have that for any number of reasons from other sorts of either environmental exposures in the past or for other etiologies. So I agree with Dr. Boykos, I wouldn't try to link those nodules with SDHA. Is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? No. Okay, and that's the same for AD's, well, C has their own thing. But yeah, C has their own, uh, C, well, the C, non-mutant C, the hypermethylation C has the chondromas. But in general, just SDH deficient or otherwise, very, very rarely would go to the lungs. And did I hear if you grew a gist first, then you're less likely to get the perineum gamma and the Maybe. I may have heard it. <laughs> Maybe. I, I mean, I think that by the time people are diagnosed, they're probably more likely to be diagnosed with both around the same time as opposed to one and then the other, but that's not uniformly true. You know, we had one patient. SDHD, uh, and he had his primary tumor removed back in the late 70s, and then the paragangliomas popped up later. But that's also more common in D, to have both. The paragangliomas are the overriding part of D, and then the gists are a little less common. But um, you know, it's 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 very variable. You know, it's hard to say that always, never, or usually, even in that situation. But I guess we could say that usually people are going to be diagnosed if they're going to have both, probably more or less around the same time. Sure. So the easiest way to differentiate between the two of them is the germline genetic testing. Because one of the most confusing things for patients, if I can speak for them, in this category is you have GIST and you have no mutations on somatic testing and you have no mutations on germline testing. Wait, what do you have? No mutations on the germline? So we know we have a germline SDHC. 
Right. So, no, you'd be over here. And also, being familial means it has to be here. Right. Right. But that's that's the germline genetic testing confirms that there's a mutation in that gene. Whereas your germline genetic testing will say no mutations in the SDHC, and somatic testing of the tumor tissue will say no mutations in SDHC or any SDH genes. If you have a tumor tested and you have no mutations in the tumor, do you also now need germline testing? Usually, yeah. I mean, I think that that would be the recommendation, right? So about 10, per if not specific to this, but about 10% of the time when you do somatic testing, the tumor type testing, um, actually, wait, so I just made a slide on the about this. Basically, <laughs> right, so sometimes you can find a germline finding in somatic testing, right? Mm -hmm. But then you need to get germline testing. But the opposite can also be true. Essentially, if you think about it, if tumors arise as an accumulation of genetic changes over time, um, in theory, you could have uh, loss of, the, you could have some kind of genetic change to the tumor that then hides the fact that there's a germline finding. So in both directions, you need testing. Um, the, about 10% of the time, there can be a germline finding that doesn't get picked up by somatic. The other piece is that the technology behind somatic is not as comprehensive because it's studying the tumor rather than the healthy genetic material. So that's the other, that's like where the 10% comes from, the combination of like chromosomal loss and uh, technology mutations. Yes. There's probably something that's not at a lot of names, but um, how frequently do people be getting tested? Only because earlier you mentioned it can sometimes have like, tissue blocks if it's It's a really good question. So for example, anytime we do a surgery to remove metastases, we will retest the tumor tissue. And that's for SDH deficient or non-SDH deficient, just because these additional mutations often get picked up. That's, that's generally what we see in kit mutant gists, is that they start with an exon 11, then they pick up an exon 13 or an exon 17. The treatment for that is fundamentally changing, and, and some of the folks who are going to be here uh, who run these trials for kit mutant gists are trying to refine the treatment strategies to account for these secondary mutations as opposed to just going in the order that FDA approval happened for different agents. For SDH deficiency, one area of interest is also, or research I should say, is to identify what is the impact of secondary mutations. So for example, P10 is a common mutation. P10 is associated with Cowden syndrome. And I know a couple of patients in the, in the past have mentioned that back in the day, Dr. Stratakis from the Carney Stratakis syndrome had said, well, this seems like Cowden syndrome before SDH deficiency was identified. Um, so P10 is common, CDK, uh, N2A. Uh, sometimes you see NF mutations, NF1, non-germline in the tumor tissue. And these things will happen more likely over time because one of the things is that Cancer cells, what do they do? When they replicate, they copy the DNA. And there's errors in replication, and sometimes these things are carried forward. What we are trying to do in my group is leverage that to try to understand, especially in multifocal gist, but also multi-metastatic gist, how can we understand, sort of, so to speak, the tumor family tree of where these different mutations were picked up over time and try and reconstruct how these happened over time when patients have had multiple surgeries with multiple samplings of tumor tissue. But to go back to your point, I don't know that it is as beneficial to retest old tumor tissue. Um, sometimes what is beneficial, Dr. Greenberg will say, if you had genetic testing in the past, depending on how comprehensive it was, it may be worthwhile to repeat because now it's an 80 gene panel and for example, lots of women 15 years ago were only being tested for BRCA1 and BRCA2, not CHECK2, not CDH1. And so a lot of these other breast cancer tumor predispositions genes were not being assessed. And so updated genetic testing, germline genetic testing, is sometimes recommended depending on how comprehensive it was done before. 
Um, just real briefly, because I know we're already over time and I, I want to allow time for more questions. So individual patient experiences are, of course, critically important. Trying to learn from aggregated experiences is also important to then be able to say what we might expect for the future for a newly diagnosed patient. Um, and so back almost 10 years ago now already, Dr. Boykos uh, and the team at the NIH, this is about eight years into the wild type just clinic at the NIH, talked about the NIH experience, looking at patients who had SDH deficient um, gists and understanding their mutations, presentations, and characteristics. And then Dr. Weldon, pediatric surgeon, looked at the outcomes of surgery. Um, Dr. Sickleton and I are, um, you know, we quibble a little bit with this because this was looked at in terms of event-free survival after surgery. Um, and it had a little bit of a pessimistic view of surgery, but, you know, of course, one of the counter-arguments for surgery and SDH deficiency is that, as you all well know better than I do, we don't have a lot of great systemic treatments to offer. And surgery is at least more definitive and I think has uh, certainly some well-defined potential benefits and then, of course, risk of complications. That being said, a lot of the treatments out there will have risks of adverse effects and side effects as well. But um, in response to these uh, companion papers, Dr. Siklik then looked at the uh, SEER database, which is a population-level database of the United States, looking at all cancer diagnoses or representative sampling of cancer diagnoses. And he looked at adolescents and young adults who had developed just as a marker of more likely SDH deficient or other wild-type gists, uh, finding a benefit, whether um, you know, it was localized disease or metastatic disease to say that surgery was beneficial or associated with a survival benefit. Uh, we built on that with an NCDB study with the National Cancer Database, um, and we looked at wild type gist. One of the nice things about NCDB is that it does specify that it's wild type. So we don't know if it's NF1, we don't know if it's SDH deficient, but we at least know that it's KIT wild type and PDGFRA wild type. And, um, we correlated what they said, what we had said before about saying it was mostly in the body and just the stomach, about 75% of the time, but also just looking at the long-term outcomes. We're actually gonna redo this analysis with uh, more updated data, because it's just through 2017, and now the data is available through 2022. Um, and we're gonna use the stomach uh, location as a surrogate marker of SDH deficiency, because NF1 just doesn't occur in the stomach, and SDH deficient just doesn't occur in the small bowel. So that will cover the vast majority of wild type etiologies and we can be a little bit more granular in our assessments of that. And just briefly, what are my questions about GIST? So as I mentioned, the regional heterogeneity of diseases, I think a very important thing because we know it starts in the stomach and then we'll maybe go to the lymph node or go directly to the liver. But um, how can we you know, understand how different mutations have been propagated through these different sites of disease? Uh, and then how can we look at the clinical implications of some of these secondary mutations. Um, last fall, in November, we started incorporating an endoscopy with all of our surgeries. And what we do with the endoscopy, um, two things. One is a lot of times they're clinically indicated, because especially with SDH deficiency, we're a lot of times talking about operating on the stomach. What we also do is look at the microbiome. And the microbiome is a catch-all term. We actually, we actually have a lot of microbiomes. We have skin microbiome, we have oral microbiome, we have esophageal microbiome, we have gastric microbiome. We have a different mi microbiome in the gastric inner lining versus the fluid in the mucus layer on top of the stomach. And it's a different microbiome than what we see in the small bowel and in stool. So what we do now is we get saliva samples, stool samples, and then with the endoscopy, we get lavage samples from the stomach as well as biopsies from the stomach. And we've been starting to do that um, for, again, almost a year. And this is gonna be an area because one of the of area of, of, in, of uh, research in the next couple of years, because one question is, again, if the mutation is there and the stomach is largely at risk, why do some people develop gist in the stomach and some people don't? even with the same mutation? And why is it developed in one part of the stomach or why is it multifocal in some patients? And trying to understand, is there an uh, implication of the microbiome in that whole process will be potentially of interest. 
Um, and then one thing in the, in the grand scheme of things is, as I mentioned, I do a lot of peritoneal surgery for other things like appendiceal cancer, ovarian cancer, mesothelioma. I use regional therapies. I put chemotherapy into the belly at the time of the surgery in order to try and kill any microscopic cells. Now, we don't have a rationale for that for GIST yet. One of the issues is, you know, what I use is chemotherapy. We don't really use chemotherapy for GIST. We use targeted therapy. Um, and one of the bigger issues is that a lot of the targeted therapies are all oral. So they're not liquid formulations that I can put through a pump and perfuse through the abdomen for 60 or 90 minutes. And we can't put them in a pump that goes into the liver to try and target metastases in the liver and downstage them and facilitate a subsequent surgery. We're not there yet, but you know, I think as surgeons, we of course specialize in local surgery. But these sorts of regional treatments a lot of times have value too because we know that there's gonna be microscopic nests of these cells and if we can get them with this sort of an approach, then maybe we can prolong that time to recurrence or potentially even prevent it. But at least if we could prolong it, that would be beneficial too. So, um, you know, just in summary, just are overall unusual, but again, the subtypes are the, the rare diseases. Um, and, you know, we're recruiting patients with various just etiologies. So our, when I designed this, this protocol, this natural history study, I didn't think that they would actually let me do this, but I said, histologically confirmed or even just suspicion of GIST. So people don't have to have a biopsy confirmed just to be able to be treated on the protocol. Uh, and that, because it can be hard to get an endoscopic biopsy because it's so deep. Even if the GI duct is like a bite on bite to try and get deeper and deeper, they can't always get the tissue. And what we're trying to do is really build out the biospecimen bank and then try and leverage that for translational research and bring it back to the patients because you're why we do this, right? Surgery is fun, don't get me wrong. But <laughs> it's more fun when we provide a benefit for the patients and they do better because of it. Uh, and of course, our collaborations with LifeRap Group and the SDH Consortium are invaluable. So with that, thank you. If anybody wants to reach out, this is my email. It's publicly available, so don't worry. <laughs> uh, and then Audra Satterwhite. Um, she's kind of done everything with our research group. Uh, you'll meet her tomorrow. Um, and so she started as a research nurse, but she's now, we're trying to figure out what her title is. I should probably have figured it out before now. But uh, I'll call her a clinical trial specialist. And so, you know, she's a tremendous resource and um, can give you a lot of good information. One of the things that, that I enjoy about the NIH that I like to mention also is I have very few barriers to providing care to whomever, right? Anybody in the world can come to the NIH and get treated. And none of the care that received uh, at the NIH is paid for by the patient. So there's some travel costs, because that's changed with our budgetary restrictions right now. But, you know, the surgery, the inpatient stay, all that stuff is covered. And I don't have to worry about dealing with insurance, I don't have to worry about getting prior authorizations. People don't have to worry about, you know, mortgaging their futures just for an opportunity of surgery. You know, there's, a, there's very few barriers, and um, it allows me to take care of anybody from the United States, allows me to take care of people from around the world. Uh, it's a really unique